This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Tech, show number 128, recorded on August 1st, 2013. Here at Home Tech, we cover all your favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios. Here in a stormy, uh, we've got some sun, thunderstorms rolling through. I think that seems to be a common theme on Thursdays. But uh, here in sunny Bellevue, Nebraska, stormy actually tonight. And we post the show with world-class show notes. Andrew, i got to get you back on that. Out at the Average Guy. Dot TV. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, you can contact the show. Just send me an email, podcast at TheAverageGuy.tv. You can find me on Twitter at Jay Collison or follow the show schedule. I actually use that this week out at the Average Guy TV. You can also join us for a live chat during the show. Head over to TheAverageGuy.tv slash live if you're on YouTube, and right below the live stream window, you can get live chat. It's live stream, so just log in. You don't need to have a user account with live stream. If you do, it remembers your preferences, but you don't have to have one. And we'd love to have you join us via tablet or mobile device as well. We've enabled low bandwidth streaming out at our live page and give that a try if you'd like. I didn't get too much feedback, although I got some live feedback last uh, last week from the guys in chat. They said it was working real well. So if you're on your mobile device, no chat. But uh, if you're out and about on your mobile device, you can listen to us live. Android, iPhone, Windows Phone, any of those. Go out to theaverageguy.tv slash live. Have a look at it. It will automatically adjust for you. And then if you want to watch the high bandwidth YouTube page all the way up in the upper right hand corner, just click on that. It says YouTube high bandwidth and that will get you a little bit better of a picture during the show. All right. Well, if you want to, we got to, if you want to stay around for a bit, we might have a little bit longer of a show tonight. We got a bunch of guys and a lot of stuff to catch up on and there's some good, this will be the last in a series of three on hard drives. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what we use and how we use them and some tools around them as well as uh, we'll get an update from Christian on kind of his whereabouts and what he's doing here coming up in the fall, quite possibly. And it's good to see Andrew out there as well. So Christian and Andrew, welcome to the show. Glad to have you out. Good to be here. And then uh, joining us tonight as well, all the way over to the right uh, on the screen, and a guy who likes to talk about window home servers, John Zadler. John, how are you? Hey Jim, hi guys. Yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, I just uh, just before the show there, like I was telling you off air, uh, just re reinstalled. Well, actually, did the Windows 8.1 preview update on my on my Windows 8 machine. So got that all going. So it was pretty good. Uh, you know, it's, Microsoft seems to be cleaning it up well. You know how they're doing their install. So are you on not that as right crazy now? as back in the day? Are you using that right now? Yeah. Fresh, man. Oh, fresh. At least it's good because, uh, you know, like one of the things when you get it going there and then you, especially with Chrome, right, when you install Chrome browser, it's sort of like the same thing is all your tabs come in, all your your uh, your uh, bookmarks and stuff. So so that's uh, just like on the phone that happens, you know, when you log in with your Microsoft ID, a lot of your stuff starts to populate, your back uh, backgrounds come in and stuff. So it gets rid of a lot of the, uh, the headaches and stuff that people had to put up with before. So hopefully uh, the new generation they'll just you know it'll be all like you know they'll just they'll just be there and they'll accept it and and we'll say I remember back in the name when, <laughs> when I had to do this. Remember when you had so to bring you your settings forward and you had to back stuff up? Remember those days? Yeah. Yeah, maybe we'll be saying that. And then next to John, John, welcome by the way. The other John in our community and uh, the the guy uh, you know over at Home Server Show, John, you. John Stutzman, you are making the round this week. Home server show last night, home tech tonight. How are you? I'm I'm great. Uh, I'm I'm kind of dizzy, you know. I'm just uh, I feel like I'm going every which way. Yeah, yeah. Well, you will talk some good stuff tonight. I know. For those who just listen to our show and don't listen to home server show, if you want to catch John over there, he is on episode 232. I think is what we're up to at this point from last night, homeservershow.com, and uh, we talked a lot. There at the end there, John, I, I'll be honest, I just let you guys talk. I kind of sat back. I got an email from, or I got a, a, a message from Mike Howard who said, hey, wake up back there on the show. So nice job of, uh, of talking all things microservers. And, of course, you are that. Later in the show, we may get uh, Kevin Schoonover back on. He just got the Gen 8 microserver, and so we might drag him in for some post-show stuff um, going forward. All right, last, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, last in the series of three about hard drives. Um, some great information. You think there wouldn't be that much to talk about. 
But as I brought in different guests on the show, they've each come at it from a unique twist. This is show 128, so you can find this, the average, the show notes, theaverageguy.tv slash 128, eh, sorry, HT128. You can find the other two, just 126 and 127. Just go out to theaverageguy.tv slash or forward slash HT and then the, the number, in that case, 126 and 127. Some good information. You know, the hard drive's not dead. Still a lot of things to talk about around there. Um, I'm going to start all the way over there with John Zadler and talk a little bit about John. I know you've got some unique drives that sit. You use that Western Digital Sentinel, and you've got some unique drives that, that are in there. But kind of what what are you what are you using for drives right now? I know I sent you a bunch of three terabyte drives about a year ago. Are those still hanging around? What are you using these days? Yeah, those drives are hanging around. The one you sent me, they were three terabyte uh, Western Digital Greens. So you know they're a little bit uh, you know quieter you know energy efficient and all that stuff and uh, you know the bigger the drives are the they're since they're three terabytes I think the the cache is uh, is larger you know 64 uh, 64 meg cache I think that's how they are and yeah with the Western Digital as you pointed out they they're using these drives which are called the enterprise drives and I think they go for about like 200, 250 300 they're like Western Digital's uh, high end drives and they're what we call um, WDRE4 GP so I guess there's somewhere there's some GP meaning I guess is that's the the green, and um, RE4 means that uh, they can be put as part of a RAID array because you know how, like some people they talk about using you know should you use green drives in uh, uh, in a RAID array because the way a RAID array works is you know you have multiple drives and and there's some redundancy and the drives are always kind of like running and they're always doing their thing and they're on 24/7 so you know you know using drives that like that are the green drives that kind of slow down or go to sleep when you you know to save power that's not the best to use so these drives they're made to always be on just like the western digital blacks i think are the high end ones and then 6 months ago didn't they come out with the the red ones which are seems to be a nice in between they're like they're quieter drives but they're not necessarily green drives so uh i ended up getting one of those green drives from western digital when i uh my warranty was almost up on my drive so i says you know what uh, i think i can call western digital and tell them um I'm not happy with this drive, so I, I sent it back to them, and they sent me a, a three terabyte uh, red. So I'm yeah. happy to have that one. Yeah. What um What are you using on the so the Windows 8 box that you have there? What are you using in there? On my uh, Windows 8 box, I'm using a 60 gig SSD. So. Uh, and then what I do is because I have the home server on my uh, I have a media smart server that's running four. Two terabyte Western Greens, so that's on there. So all my content, what I try to do is have all my the, my documents, folders, pictures, videos, and everything. All my content running on the server. You know, all that whatever takes up a lot of disk space, let that go to the server, and uh, just use the PC for uh, you know for the uh, the quick stuff there, the um, you know the apps and stuff like that. And so I I want to keep very little as I uh, very little um, you know hard uh, data on my uh, laptop drive. So then when I do if my computer does crash and I do have to do a, a server a PC recovery, I'm not bringing in all kinds of stuff. You know, I'm just bringing in, you know, the OS and and some of the little programs I'm using. So uh, that's the way it goes for me. You know, John, you just said laptop drive, and it just reminded me. I was on, on my uh, kind of my workbench uh, that I work on all the PCs. It's just on the other side of the monitors here, and I've got six laptop drives, 5400 RPM. They're mostly Western Digital, the blue. Uh, laptop drive, so 5400 RPM drives. Not great. They're okay. I have six of those just stacked up. I I don't know why. I bought them at various stages and I've kind of stopped using them, and so they're just they're just sitting on the bench stacked up. They're not great performers to put in desktop, so I've kind of left those out for that. But I'd always kind of hoped I was going to get that Mario would send me one of those Drobo Minis that took the two yeah. and a half inch drives, and I, I just about had one, and then the merger took place. <laughs> Mario was asked to leave, and I didn't get a Drobo Mini, so they it, they sit right. unused at this point. So I got a few stacked up. Do you have any stacked up that you just use as spares, or are you using everything at this point? Yeah, I'm using everything. Oh. I got, like I said, four drives in my DX4000. I got uh, the four two terabyte drives in the uh, the Media Smart server, and then I got some one terabyte drives. The smallest drives I have really are the one terabyte drives. Those are also green drives. Again, you know, they were they were you know they came out before the Reds, and uh, so those ones are in an enclosure that I use to actually back up. Because you know, even though you have a media smart server and all your content is there, just because it's there does you know 
that might be your like I said, since I move my files to there, my documents, pictures, and everything, you know, that might I might just have one copy there. So I want to I do want to have a backup. The the media smart server doesn't mean that that's a backup. It just means that's where all my files are. So by so since I do want to back it up, I connect it to a. Uh, uh, Sans Digital four bay enclosure, and that guy has, like I said, the four one terabyte drive. So I uh, I throw my I duplicate my content or back up the content onto those drives, and uh, that's about it. anything smaller than the five than a one terabyte drive. I don't want to. Uh, you got to chuck them. They're, they they start to be uh, you <laughs> know pass, like, pass what? down. Yeah, give, give back in the day, else. you had the 80s, the 40 and 80 gigs and 160 gigs. It's like there's no use coming, uh, keeping them, because even now the the smaller drives, like the single drives that uh, I think Western Digital are building, uh, it's like a 500 gig drive. Like you know, it's one disk. You know, because the technology for the disk get, gets better, they're able to put more data on the one disk. So back in the day, when you had a 500 gig drive, there might have been two or three platters, you know, in in the drive. Whereas now you can get a very en energy efficient drive, one platter, and it's 500 gigs. It's like I I'd be hard pressed to see if, if you can actually find a drive that is, uh, you know, on the s on the small capacity side, like a, a 250 or a 320 or something. Yeah, I've got some. I've got a 320 drive on this studio PC. I actually use it to record TV to, and so it holds uh, probably two months of of recordings for me, and that's good enough. It that way, I don't get too much data on that drive. You know, it kind of limits that artificially because it, as soon as it fills up, then Windows Media Center starts deleting those TV programs off of it. So I keep about two months worth of stuff on the drive. Yeah, so. yeah oh, that's a good point can, because. Yeah. Go ahead, John. I was gonna say you bring up a good point because if you have a, you let's say your main PC like mine is the SSD, <laughs> and if I'm recording TV shows, uh, it's not good to you know it's gonna record to the to that hard drive to the SSD drive, and then like you say you know then you're you're off, you're off uh, what do you call that off shooting off you know, you're offloading taking, offloading it yeah to the server. It's like that SSD is getting too much mess, so it's better to just throw in and maybe a laptop drive like you say a 320 or something. Just put a, a little bit of a junky drive, you know. Just to be that sort of like drive that's going to pick up all that data, and then it's going to get tossed to uh, to your server. So as long as it's running around, you know, it doesn't have to be like best reliable drive because you're just using it temporarily and then putting it there. As long as it works, as long as it's a workhorse. But if it's a slow drive, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks, John. John Stutzman, I want to ask you the same question. We've asked all the guests so far what they're using, and uh, you've got quite a list. Uh, you, now, you concluded what you've used and are using. Let's limit that to what you kind of currently have. What's the – just kind of quickly run down what, you're currently, what you are currently using. Well, pretty much the drives that are in that list, and, and – uh, uh, I, I do have a number of Western Digital uh, EADS green drives, uh, one and a half terabyte or two terabyte, um, and uh, those were originally what I was getting for my uh, version one of Windows, but uh, now I'm using them a lot for uh, backup drives. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm pretty much I'm using them all for that. Um, one I had installed in a uh, build that I uh, had helped my son with. Uh, we were going to use a Western Digital Black, and it was uh, DOA, so we uh, I uh, grabbed a 2 terabyte uh, green, and we stuck it in there, and that's been running for a year and a half, uh, and it was about two years old when I when I put it in there. So it's uh, uh, it's a very reliable drive. Now, when uh, back when uh, John will remember, he helped me uh, rebuild my uh, version 1 uh, box, and uh, I had a Western Digital uh, EARX. Uh, it was a 20 ter or a two terabyte. Um, it was the advanced format. It had the larger cache, and uh, uh, I tried it out as a, a system drive and had to do some gyrations to use it, and it worked out fabulously. It, it was it was really a nice drive. I could see a big speed difference, so I ended up populating the entire uh, uh, my EX487 with uh, EARXs. Um, so I, I have four of those things, and then I have a couple of uh, Western Digital uh, 30 uh, EZRXs. That's their three terabyte uh, version of the advanced format green drives. Uh, six uh, SATA 3 uh, ports on them with 64 uh, meg of uh, caching. And I have one Western Digital uh, three terabyte red um, 
it's uh, the EFRX, and uh, I have that in the, it's, it's overkill for my HTPC, and um, I'm thinking of yanking it out and putting something smaller in, but then I'm not sure where I would stick the red after that, so, since there's only one of them. Um, I got a, a, a two terabyte uh, uh, Western Digital Black, an FAEX, and a one terabyte, both are uh, six gig um, or uh, SATA three type drives with uh, 64 uh, megabyte caches. And then I, the probably the vast number of uh, drives that I have are the uh, Seagate ST3000 uh, DM001s. Uh, those things are fast drives. I, I really, the first one I got, I just got sort of like when I got the single red, you know, I got one Seagate, tested it, and the performance I just thought was phenomenal. And um, so I've ended up uh, getting about 13 of those drives. And what? I, 13? I, I, I've accumulated what? them over time. <laughs> what are you doing with, these are USB drives? Uh, no, no. No, these, these are internal. Are, Internal drives. Okay, all right. The ST3000 DM001. Where would you even put 13 drives? Well, I have five of them in my uh, wow. win Windows Home Server uh, 2011. Okay. And um, so the, the other eight? And the other eight, uh, four are in, uh, in my build uh, where I built a uh, storage server. Okay. Um, to, uh, uh, and I wrote up about that, uh, how I used it for... Uh, 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 testing some things uh, um, and how I use it to keep track of all my uh, uh, all my VMs. I make copies of my VMs and then store them out there uh, from my different machines. So I have them all. So I have like a second storage in a in a in a site, but those are actually mirrored. So it's it gives me some redundancy. The you, other you might you might be rivaling the uh, Johnson family total storage. So have you gone through this list and figured out? So Christian, while I'm talking about this, think about what's the total storage you guys have available at the Johnson family household. John Stutzman, how much do you think you've got all here? Um, well, well, tell me you haven't counted it. You you could add them <laughs> up. I, I I haven't done that. Um, <laughs> And, you know, it's I, the whole point of it is, uh, and the other four I've been using, um, I did use the other four before when I was testing uh, uh, Essentials, uh, 2012 Essentials, and I had a box build with that in it. And I had uh, the uh, Seagate drives in it, and it was ba I basically made it as a duplicate of my Windows Home Server in 2011 as far as data so that I could really... Uh, you know, beat on the thing. I kept them synced up with uh, Always Sync and everything, and got to. I, I ran it for a good six months and really uh, banged on it with storage spaces. And uh, before I tore it apart, and then I've used those drives for various testings, uh, things that I've posted up on the, you know, on the blog over at the home yeah. server. We'll tell folks if you're again if you just listen to this show and you're not listening to homeservershow.com and you're wanting to see some of John's uh, performance testing, he does a probably better job than anybody I've seen when it comes to actually writing up performance um, tests on drives. Head over to homeservershow.com. He's riddled throughout the, uh, the you know the newer posts, so you can check those out. Yeah, I, I gave you some links in the show notes, uh, yep. Yep. but. Uh, uh, surprisingly, too, I've found with the testing that I do, um, it's actually a lot better if I have the smaller drives. And I was, uh, so I really was kind of coveting those um, 250 gigabyte drives that uh, we get with the uh, microservers. And I had three of them. And then I had a, uh, an old Seagate that had come with my original uh, EX487. It was my original OS drive. And I was using those four drives, and I came some occasions where I needed more little drives. So I, I bought a couple of uh, white label drives for like 30 some bucks, 33 bucks. And uh, so I, I use those to just kind of, you know, it's like I have a RAID car. If I want to set something up in RAID, I can just use the small drives, play around with it to see what things I can do. 
and uh, like if you're setting up a RAID 5 or a RAID 6, I don't have to waste a lot of time waiting for the thing to build itself out. I can just put the drives in and play with it. Um, now another thing that uh, I haven't even touched on, and I know uh, it happened to you, and probably uh, the same guy did it to me, Kevin Schoonover. I, I hope he's listening. Uh, he got uh, got us both, uh, well I won't speak for you, but he got us onto the Velocity Raptor bandwagon. He showed us uh, a cheap source for him and then once I started seeing those things there and the first one I got was a uh, uh, it was a, actually a generation 6 uh, VR from uh, from those guys uh, and I tested it and I thought oh my god this is great and uh, and so I've, I've started doing other things with uh, uh, Velocity Raptors and like in my desktop when I uh, that I'm speaking from uh, this is kind of I'm kind of diverging here but you know uh, you just cut me off anytime you want but <laughs> at the my desktop is an x58 it's a, a gigabyte and it had some uh, G SATA 3 ports but they weren't really very good as uh, uh, SATA 3 ports they weren't very fast they didn't have uh, they were they were only topping out at about 400 uh, which is just barely above SATA 2. And, but the thing was, when I upgraded it to uh, Windows 8 Pro, um, the uh, G SATA, uh, the Marvell controllers, weren't compatible. And so I had to shut all that stuff down. So now all I'm stuck with is the ins I have six Intel ports that I can use. Well, uh, I can't really get much speed for like video rendering because um, I have an i7 in this machine. But uh, when I'm using Camtasia to video render uh, uh, videos, like from my last vacation, we had three cameras and we shot uh, almost two hours worth of video. And I wanted to like stitch it all together on all, all the different formats. And you know, there's a lot of banging on the hard drive. So I went and I ordered uh, uh, some uh, Velocity Raptors and I put three of those in a, in a RAID zero and it is nice. I love it. Yeah, it, it is. It fast. is great. Yeah, <laughs> we talked. We we've talked about that before. You know, I, I built that same thing out, and it is just lightning fast uh, to do it that way. So that's um, that's always a good call, John. You've um, so you on your main boxes that you you've you've also and we've talked about this extensively. So I don't want to go too much into it, but you made the switch, right? You got SSDs on most of the production stuff that you're most of the PCs that you're running. You've got uh, SSDs up front. Every computer now that I have, except for my original uh, V1 box, was which is a EX487, has at least one SSD, and, and it's and it's for the OS drive. Do you have a preference? Uh, you know, everybody kind of seems to have their preference on SSD. Do you have uh, your preference on the company you like to go with? Well, I, I started out with Intel, and I liked them, and but then I moved on from there to Crucial, and I like Crucial. Um, and then I went to Corsair, and then I just recently have uh, purchased uh, some Samsung. I would say my preference now going forward uh, would be Samsung or maybe Crucial, just depending on the application. Uh, I do like the Corsair GTX, but if if you want that kind of uh, you know video processing horsepower. I, I think you might as well just go Samsung uh, 840 Pro and, and be done with it. Uh, okay. I, I did put a couple of Samsung 840 Pros in uh, in a RAID 0 and stuck that into my uh, Hyper-V server along with several uh, VRs in RAID 0 to give me some uh, VM uh, VM drives to, to work with. And um, I really like them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'd say. And I, <laughs> and I have a RAID 0. Yeah, that I, should be I, pretty I, fast. Yeah, I put four VRs uh, in a RAID zero, and then I put two Samsungs in a RAID zero, okay. and uh, so and they have about the same performance. So it's uh, uh, the the four Velocity Raptors were giving me something like about a throughputs of eight nine hundred. I, I got it posted on the uh, in the forums over at home server, and uh, the Samsungs were giving me about a uh, thousand to eleven hundred uh, throughput. Uh, read fast. Yeah, pretty fast. So it's uh, uh, John. You just John Zadler. You just held something up. What what were you trying to show there? Yeah, that's the uh, that's my 60 gig uh, Agility three, 
drive that I got uh, whatever last year and stuff. So okay. still yep. uh, still holding in there. Okay. Um, so John, your question: What's your preference then on on um, SSDs? You asking me or yeah, John? John John Stutzman? What's your preference? Uh, if you're gonna buy one now. What do you what are you leaning towards? I would look at the Samsung 840 Pro okay. first. All right. Good enough. Good. That gives us a good landscape of what you got. We want to talk a little bit about tools. Everybody's got a different set of tools that they use on their drives. Um, I'll go back to John Zadler and uh, John. What do you What do you prefer when you're checking hard drives? Uh, what are the What are your go to tools at this point? Hmm. Well, in Windows 8, there uh, I use the built-in uh, what is it? Their disk cleanup and then the defrag. So and it does some kind of trim, you know. As far as like uh, when now the operating systems are smart enough to know if you have a uh, a uh, spindle drive or a uh, what do you call it there an SSD drive. So then it'll say, okay, you know, you have a uh, a spindle drive, and it'll run the defrag, and there you go. And if you have an SSD drive, then it'll say, okay, uh, you know, we'll check for because uh, there's an option that uh, you might have discussed in the past, like trimming, like you know, you don't. In a SSD, because it's memory, you're not running and uh, you know moving things around so that it's all at the front of the drive. But you do want to kind of like uh, clear some bytes and like you know, reset them to zero. So uh, Microsoft, you know, they made their software, and and I, and I use that. For me, as I'm not like you know a diehard uh, crazy guy as far as you know uh, fine tuning my my drive. So the built-in uh, software that comes with uh, with Windows is is what I use. Okay. No no, no extra special tools on the outside. Um, you know, no hard drive data, you know, Western Digital's got a set of things. I mean, you have anything that you go to whenever you're having hard drive problems? Well, in the past, I would play around with, since I had the home server, most of my drives were there. You know, there's a couple of apps there. Uh, uh, one is uh, the media, what is it, the media, um, one is from StableBit, and the other one is, drive uh, scanner. Mm -hmm. yeah, StableBit Scanner, and the other one is uh, that guy that was on your show he was on a podcast before there. And yeah. He has his uh, media smart smart uh, status, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Matt uh, Sawyer, I think mm -hmm. his uh, his software. So when it comes to the hard drives like that, you know, then maybe I'll play around with it. Maybe I'll put it on there. But it's a bit like uh, if I start to see the drives giving me a hard time, your know, message will pop up, and it's like the return policy with Western Digital is so great that it's like okay, it's, it seems a little flaky. I, I don't need to know 100% that yeah, my drive is going to fail. It's like okay, it's giving me a bit of trouble. And then I just fired them off. I send them back and get a replacement. Okay. John Stutzman, uh, you've got a list. We've talked about some of these already. So in the last couple of weeks, we've talked about Crystal Disk, Info, and Mark. ATTO, which is one of my favorites. If I think that's for, for the average consumer. If We haven't talked in depth about ATTO, but it's, it's super easy to install, super easy to use. When you're doing benchmark testing, you use that it kind of, I don't want to say exclusively, but you use it a lot, right? I mean, that's kind of your go-to well, it, tool? It, it was the first uh, hard disk uh, benchmarking tool that I used. So because it was the first, I I always use it so that I could always compare performance to benchmarks that I ran three years ago. Um, and so I always use ATTO, but then, you know, I've also picked up some other benchmark tools along the way. Crystal Disk this mark is, is very good. HD Tune. I'm starting to play around with that. There's there's others out there that I've been looking at. Passmark uh, has a, uh, a toolkit set uh, that uh, is is looking really interesting. I I've gotten pretty close to uh, purchasing that, uh, and it's it's pretty cheap. So it's it's something worth looking at. I think. But when you when you say pretty cheap, what do you mean? Uh, I'm I'm thinking it was like twenty thirty bucks. Oh, that is pretty cheap. And they they have a, uh, a no nonsense uh, uh, copyright policy where you know you buy it you can use it in your home you know so you can use it on any of the computers in your home you don't have to uninstall it and sign away your firstborn and all this stuff every time you want to move it from computer to computer. Um, I, I just wanted to make a comment too. Uh, John mentioned StableBit Scanner and I think. Uh, 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 you know, I, we talked before about I had those uh, Seagate drives, and I had never had a Seagate go bad on me until just recently. Uh, scanner, uh, I was checking the, the computer, and Scanner was giving me an error, you know, saying, you know, that uh, uh, the drive was about to fail, 
and uh, to get my data off of it. And so I, I took it out. I thought, well, you know, maybe it's not really that bad. So then I started looking at it, and I pulled. I have Seagate tools and the Western Digital tools. I think everybody should have those in their toolbox. And so I, I started checking it with Seagate, and Seagate couldn't even uh, do a full test. It was failing. And uh, so it gave me a chance to experience uh, Seagate's return policy, which I thought was pretty cool in their Seagate tools. If you fail, you can uh, click and it takes you to warranty information. It tells you how much longer your warranty is good for. Mine was still good to December of 2014. And uh, it also took you to uh, show you your options as far as, uh, uh, you know, how to return it and stuff like that. So, in fact, it should have gotten to Seagate today. I, well, I checked UPS it right there today. And uh, the, they're going to ship me a new one, so we'll see how that works. But uh, that's kind of a side note. But my philosophy on hard drives now is if uh, uh, I want uh, tools that just help me get my data off of it if it's going to fail, if I, I want warning that it's going to fail and I want to get my data off, and then I want to, if it's under warranty, I'm not going to mess around with it. I'm just going to, uh, just like John said, I'm going to return that thing. Yeah. Uh, if you're having problems with a hard drive, you know, even if it costs you money uh, to send it back, you're only talking six to ten bucks to, um, depending on how you do it, to uh, send the drive back and get a whole new drive. And uh, uh, Western Digital has been good about that. And uh, and it's if their uh, policy so far with Seagate, think the hoops that I've jumped through. It, they seem at least as good, if not better, than Western Digital to deal with. Yeah, they both do a pretty nice job. Uh, Christian, let me ask you, and Andrew, be ready. Uh, you guys have sat on, on two of these three shows. Any other tools that you're that you guys use that uh, maybe we haven't mentioned in the last two or three? We've covered a lot of them, but between the two of you, anything else that we missed? Um, no, I know we use Ada a lot, and we've used HD Tune Pro. Um, in terms of seeing if drives are faulty, I think I mentioned last week the the diagnostic health managers that are sometimes included in the BIOS and the um, health report that you can generate in Windows Vista 7 and 8, um, which is really useful for that kind of stuff. But that's about it. Okay. Andrew, anything that uh, you guys use at the enterprise level? No, not really. I mean, most of our stuff gets picked up by, you know, something like um, Insight Manager or... Well, you know, physical walk around. I mean, we um, we do a lot of centralized monitoring. I mean, in the home, I use I only really look for preemptive failure. So I'll use something like Crystal Crystal Disk Info just to see what the smart the smart status is on the on the box at any given given time. If I think there's something wrong with it, but I tend to just wait for things to fail, or I'm not really that concerned about benchmarking. If it doesn't work, then I sort of go with the thing that I'll I'll, I'll worry about it when it breaks. Yeah, and uh, Andrew, I'm, any... I'm, not, I'm not concerned about performance. I just stream, stream <laughs> video, so you know, and, and do backups. So I don't don't really have that much production throughput. Sure. In the enterprise, are you guys seeing any any, any preferences that you guys uh, see? You know, uh, constant failures in one area or something that works real well? No, under? not really. I mean. You know, we use a lot of um, remanufactured product. Um, you know, if you put in a warranty claim on a on an HP supplied disc, you'll typically get a re a remanufactured one come back. Um, if it's a warranty claim, you know, some of the new boxes even get shipped with them. It's no, you know, at the end of the day, the enterprise grade stuff. I mean, we've got drives that have been spinning for over a million hours and and you know, no issues with them. But then we've got other drives that all fail within the first couple of hundred. So yeah, we don't we don't even bother looking anymore. We just wait for them to fail, and if they fail, then we replace them. You don't tend to go down to the level that you would at home. You know, at home, it's a bit more of an emotive experience, whereas in the enterprise, it's like, oh well, you know, it failed. Let's get a, get the service restored and get back into it. Yeah, yeah, a little less personal. Yeah, yeah. Right. At the end of the day, not, you know, the world's not going to stop if um, you know, if you if you drop a mirror or a RAID disk in the enterprise, because typically you've got a a better class of backup, and you've, you know, you've got a faster restore mechanism, and you've usually got more redundancy built into your system at the time. Um, 
you know, I think anyone in the enterprise or small business who's not using RAID or RAID, RAID, minimum of RAID 1, then you're asking for trouble. Um, but, you know, the, the type of um, environment I, I support, you know, we, we, if we use RAID 1 at a minimum. We don't use RAID 0 at all. Um, that's in local system and everything in the, in the SANS is at least RAID, RAID 5, 5, 6, 6 plus 0. Um, even 10 just depends on the type of disk that we need to provision. But you know, sand, sand failure. You know, you've got the smarts of the, you've got the smarts within the firmware that that handle preemptive failure and whatnot. So typically, your data gets gets shifted around the enclosure and yeah, shifted around the enclosure and then it, then it'll tell you that the that the disk that needs replacing and and you know label it as failed. So. Yeah, it's different, very different type of um, type of management. You know, yeah. in the enterprise, we use a lot of SAS as well. We don't use, uh, yeah, we use SAS. We don't use a lot of um, a lot of SATA drives at all. Um, yeah, it is. It is a little bit. Time. It is a little bit different for, than than the consumer. Let me let me throw this question out to the four of you guys, and, and we this isn't one I really vast on the other shows, but. We haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the future. What um, certainly, uh, if uh, if SSD follows the um, follows the lead of where we went with with spinners, drives get cheaper and they get larger as we go forward. And I, and I think right now, you know, the breaking point is probably oh that 128 or 256. Uh, for SSD drives, I've heard uh, and read that uh, the the there are some math or mechanical problems with getting SSD lar getting them larger and larger. It's not you just can't make more spindles. You just can't get you know those sizes. Well, guys, what do you think the future as we look out? Um, you know, three to five years from now, do do is there enough room in the SSD space? For those to just keep growing and for them to get cheaper, or is there something else on the horizon that I don't know about? Well, Moore's law says you've got to be able to pack more into the same the same box as technology evolves, doesn't it? So, you know, I mean, SSDs are still in a my, my take is SSDs are still in a sub 2.5 inch form factor. So, you know, and, until they 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 reach the the full full size of a 3.5 and are fully loaded, I think there's a there's a fair bit of growth left. But can we can we take uh an SSD drive, blow it out to three and a half, and make it larger. And does that, at the larger one terabyte, two terabyte, three terabyte, does that work? I mean, can we can we grow SSDs that way, or um, does SSD have some limit that it, it it can only go up so far, and then we're we're done? I I, I don't I don't know. Does that work? Can we can we still yeah, get that large? There's no limit right now. Okay. You could take SSDs and uh, and rate them together. Uh, RAID 1 or RAID uh, 0, uh, RAID 10, uh, and uh, achieve some fantastic uh, performance. Uh, and, and I know PC Doc had posted and I had read too uh, a uh, study where uh, just for fun, some, uh, some folks took uh, eight crucials and attached them to a uh, rocket RAID 2720 and uh, rated them and put them in a RAID 0, and I, I don't recall the performance, but it was really nice. Um, and it's so really all you're asking is can they take that and shrink it down to a smaller package? Uh, I mean, you, you know, you take eight uh, uh, 256 uh, uh, gig uh, SSDs, you know, say like the M4s, um, and you were to rate them together in zero, well, that's, that's uh, two terabytes right there. Um, so what yeah, you're just, what I you're just, really wanting to do is shrink it down to a smaller package. The problem right now is is that we're we're getting close to maxing out the SATA threes with the SSDs that we have. Uh, you look at the highest performance SSDs out there, and they're pushing close to that uh, uh, theoretical 600 uh, cap uh, performance or throughput that you have. So. You know, like when you ra when they rated them with the uh, the rocket raid, uh, they they still had that cap on each channel, but then they had all the all the additional SATA channels that they could deal with. Uh, now next year or the year after, we're going to start seeing uh, boards coming out uh, with the SATA Express, 
Um, and while I'm not up on a lot of the details, I mean, you're, you're looking at a big potential, and you know, well, it's going to raise the cap. So once you raise the cap, well, then the thing is, uh, uh, you know, who's going to be filling it? And I, I've read studies. I wish I had a link to it. All, all I remembered uh, to put in the show notes was the link to that uh, uh, that uh, uh, crystal uh, hard disk drive that uh, you may want to talk about later. But I had read a study uh, where Samsung had done some stuff and had like uh, uh, in a test setup had uh, uh, I, don't quote me exactly, but I know it was something like about 1.6 read writes, uh, uh, which is which is pretty nice. That's that would be like three uh, putting three uh, 840 pros in a RAID zero. You know that. Uh, so I I think uh, in the next year or two you're gonna you know you're gonna see a bump up in with the SATA Express and then. Uh, and you're going to start seeing SSDs to fill that. What's up with the uh, what's that the interface? They call it Thunderbolt. Those are that's for hard drives, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and is there some kind of speed on there or what? I I, I don't know. I I was just reading some of the stuff from chat, and, mm -hmm. and I got distracted. I apologize. Uh, I I don't know much of anything about Thunderbolt. I haven't. It really has not been a standard. I mean, it was you know, uh, Apple kind of controlled the uh, the the cable on that for a while, and uh, we saw some Thunderbolt products come out. Oh, two years ago, I think at CES, not really. You know, the the external hard drive using Thunderbolt, at least for the main consumer, has not really caught on for the most part. So, they still kind of sit. I don't know, Andrew, Christian, have you guys? Uh, let me, Christian. Let me ask you: Does Thunderbolt showed up on your radar at all, and in the area? I mean, it's no, no, no. I, I mean, the stuff that I've seen has just been considered kind of the high, high-priced uh, outlier. I mean, that you know, it's you, you had to have a very specialized application to want to use it, and yeah. I, you know, I looked not at the like price USB and three. didn't look much farther. Yeah, yeah, I'm not like USB three. Christian, are we seeing anything? Uh, John mentioned uh, we're coming. You know, we're, we're starting to push SATA, you know, SATA three at this point. From what you know, with with BIOS mods and and such, anything that you know coming on on motherboards themselves to begin to push that limit? Um, not on board. I mean, I know we're pretty well within our SATA six limits, which a lot of the new boards are at now, but. Um, yeah, SATA 3, you have to be rating some SSDs to really hit that threshold. And like I said, if you're putting the money in the SSDs, chances are you're at SATA 6 anyway. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But you know, Jim, the new PC, well, like, I mean, Apple, they, they came, out, came out with that little, uh, with the trash can uh, PC, right? So uh, aren't they connecting their drives? Like, are they using Thunderbolt? Like, you kind of wonder as maybe PCs get kind of smaller, and then we want we do want to have like say two terabyte drives. It's like what's gonna happen? What are you gonna be using when your you know when your PC is gonna be you know big like this? You know it's gonna be like the size of a you know pack of cigarettes or whatever. It's like what are you gonna connect to it? You know and what type of interface are you gonna have? Wonder where that's gonna end up. Yeah, well, Rennie's saying in chat, you know, the PCI is the next connector, and there is in some. In some regard, right? I don't know a lot about this. I do, you know, the Drobo 5 uh, D, or no, 5N that I have has an M SATA connector in the back, right? And that, mm. in theory, that can be connected to a PCI bus. And I don't know the difference between, you know, between a SATA connection and a PCI connection from a speed perspective. Are there, can anybody quote any stats, Andrew? Couldn't, couldn't give you stats, but I know it's faster. I mean, we, we're using embedded. Um... M SATA for a lot of a lot of caching um, at the moment. I mean, you know, you look at you look at a SAN, for example, and all, all the caching on a SAN, none of it's on SSD or spindle. It's all on. It's all sol It's all solid state on a on a wide bus. It's not on a not on a you know a narrow bus like SATA or SATA or um, or SAS. So, you know, so, so it's all on the wideband stuff. With SSDs going where they're going and M SATA being what it is, why aren't we just moving? Uh, you know, why don't we have see 
um, and and Sata kind of on PCI taking over as kind of the boot drive for PC. I think it's cost to market. I think the smaller you get, you make the technology, the more expensive it is. So you look at something like like this this guy, which I'll just unwrap. Unboxing right here. Yep, you <laughs> saw it live. Um, yes. So this thing's a um, a fiber right back controller for a uh, which will fit a Gen 8 micro server. Right, that thing's got 512 meg of 512 yeah meg of RAM on it. Um, it's it's wholesale price around about 460 bucks. Yeah. So don't drop you, any coffee on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so you know, some something like that. I think retail they're around out here. They're of running around about eight hundred bucks at the moment. Ouch. Because you know, so, one of the things I was thinking is like the micro servers now, like the Gen Eight. You know how now they well, the the earlier ones they had the uh, built in the USB uh, socket on the board, and now the new yep. Gen Eight they have a SD uh, SD card socket on the motherboard. You know, so it would be nice yeah. to see uh, motherboards coming out that gives you the option, and again, like the to you know to at least put in an MSATA card, like not sell it with it, just like the microservice, they're selling them now without any hard drives so that, you know, to keep the cost down. So it would be nice to see uh, that kind of thing go along, that if you said, look, if I want to put in an SSD drive, I'll buy it separately. If I want a hard drive, I'll buy it separately. But it would be nice to have an MSATA connector on there. So at least this way, if you wanted to buy your 60 gig from whoever it was or 120 or 256, mm -hmm. then at least you can upgrade them. Because one of the things with the earlier microservices, you know, the CPU, it's like, it's fixed, so you can't update it. The new gens, uh, Gen 8 uh, servers, you can upgrade the CPU. So it would be nice to see uh, not like a fixed hard drive space, you know, on there. It's like, okay, uh, I have outgrown the 60 gig uh, MSATA card, just pop it out like you would, you know, pop out your your memory and upgrade your memory, yep. upgrade your uh, MSATA uh, card. Do you know if there's a lot well, of uh, small uh, boards out there that have uh, MSATA, like, Right out there, well, built well, I, guess the you, I, I guess you look at the number of laptops now that are coming coming to market that have an MSATA accelerator on them. You know, um, okay. I think. <coughs> pardon me. Um, my my take on that is it's a it's a it's giving you hybrid drive performance without the cost of the hybrid drive, and so you've got the scalability. So you look at say, uh, I think Dell's one of the Inspiron. Well, I saw one of them the other day that had a 32, 32 meg or 64 meg M SATA module on it. But then you can change over your drive from you know, a 500 to a one terabyte spindle drive without having to worry about losing your investment in the hybrid technology if you've if you would have otherwise gone down that path. So I think, yeah, I thought I know. I think I think it's I think it, it it's it's part of the the the, the growth cycle and the technology, um, I think it's going to be interesting to see where they go next because at the end of the day, it's still Flash, right? The, the MSATA technology. Yeah, you would so. think Flash is Flash, right? It's just how it's connected to the board. So yeah. why can't we, you know, why couldn't somebody develop the OS drive to have a, a 60 or 120 gig um, SSD that connected through PCI? Well, you can get PCI... Um, you can get PCI drive cards now in the enterprise. So we um, we built a uh, what was it? It's a ProLiant DL380 Gen 8 server. So you know your three unit high box. You know so what's that? Ten centimeters high. Um, those things had two 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 terabyte PCI X riser cards in them, but the cost of those cards was about 15 times the price of the server. <laughs> Well, yeah, um, it's because it's not mainline, right? It's not mainstream yeah. production yet. Yeah, they're 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 not quite bleeding edge, but they're pretty close to bleeding edge um, accelerated storage technology. And you know, these things are running seriously, seriously big MySQL databases. And moving that that system from Spindle with accelerated chips to to these PCIe X cards. Um, they got something like a 150% improvement in database database response time. So you know the technology is there, but I think each card was twelve and a half thousand dollars or something. So you, you you definitely pay for the privilege. So the cost offset 
you know, yeah. in the in the home the home right. space. It's just right. it's totally not, out it's of the still realm. Still not there but, yet. No, it's yeah. we're still where, you know, I think at this point we're still at the SSD realm. You know, we're all on the edge yeah. of putting just regular SSDs in our, um, you know, in our boxes yeah. and being good with it. Just wondering what yeah. you guys thought the future looked like for the average user going forward. Certainly, we always well, coach. I think always, that, go ahead. I think that technology will come down. I think it'll it'll come it'll come through at some point in time. Um, you know, you look at um, SSDs. You know, SSDs were first seen in the enterprise as pretty much cache caching controllers in SANs and 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 the like. Um, so I think the curves the curves already started. I think it's just a matter of when it's going to come through. Um, you know, the 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 greater the adoption and the immersion into the enterprise and not even the small business at this stage, but you know, the more enterprise picks it up, the f- and the faster they adopt it, the the faster those prices are going to come down and become more affordable. Now, I'd reckon give it give it a couple of years, and you, I reckon we'll probably see you know people going the full faux show on stuff like that and buying a couple of them. Okay, well I have to wait. No, Jim, okay, I wonder. Go, go ahead, John. I wonder, it's like, remember they had those laptops, what do you call them, Chromebooks, where it's basically you're just connected to, to Wi-Fi and you're getting all your content there. So I wonder if, if at a point some of those those two things will converge. It's like you'll have enough, let's say, hard drive space. You'll have a, a 256 uh, gigabyte the SSD drive in your computer, and then the, mostly your content will be like online, you know, so you'll, you'll have enough programs on there. Uh, either on a memory chip or whatever, like your OS is on your computer, whatever content you want, you're like syncing, let's say, it'll sync the, uh, your local drive, that SSD drive with what's online, and if you want to get your content, because remember with the home server, we used to have everything at home, and now it's like, well, just go online and, you know, and get your, uh, you know, stream it from online, so, and I think Microsoft even wants to do where the OS, it's almost like you're, you're out of your PC and you're actually streaming the OS, remember like with the updates, how uh, one of the Windows 8 updates, it's like, you're actually streaming a program to your computer instead of just streaming uh, like a, a music or video. You're streaming program. So imagine if your computer could be connected to you know you're you're in an area just like you know if you get outside the area your cell phone's not going to work. But if you're within a certain area, it's like okay, just stream whatever content I need on my on my PC to do what I want. Then the rest uh, you know it's up in the cloud. When I need it, it comes from the cloud onto my PC and and I use it. So I think at a certain point you'll be like you know you have a, how much space do I need on my computer? Then how much space you know how fast is the is the is the uh, the Wi-Fi so that I could get my content as as I need it as I'm you know moving forward? So mm. that might be a possibility. I don't know. I'm dreaming. I'm I'm thinking that it's going to be more uh, we're going to be see the down to the average user is going to see the driving down a price of tiered storage. Uh, we're going to see that more and more. Uh, we're just starting to see it in the latest release, uh, the R2 release for uh, Essentials and Server. I think you're going to see that pushed out further. And, um, you know, as prices come down, that's, you know, you're, you're going to, st- I think, still want to be doing your massive storage uh, on uh, four, five, six terabyte uh, drives, but you're going to have. Uh, uh, flash memory of some sort uh, where that's going to give that a boost of performance so that the end user can cheaply see some pretty high performance. Uh, sort of like the uh, the Intel acceleration that uh, you have on the motherboard now. And I experimented with that uh, uh, with uh, virtual drives. Uh, and it worked really well, except if you uh, I had a power outage and I lost about a half dozen VMs that I had to rebuild. And so I kind of soured on it at the time. But I think uh, that technology improves. You have battery backup or maybe just get somebody that knows what they're doing. And um, and I, I think it's going to be uh, accepted more and more. Mm. All right. Good point. Guys, um, you know, we've been talking hard drives for a couple, three weeks now. I'll, I'll do one last Shout out. There's a few things I want to cover kind of before we wrap up the show tonight, and I want to do some catch-up of some other things. But anything else, John? I know you've got a ton of articles on performance and in the show notes, uh, some of the 2011 stuff. I, I didn't necessarily want to hash through some of that tonight on the show, but 
we'll send folks to homeservershow.com if they want to get some information. You know, we we reference you over there as the uh, the microserver master uh, and all and all those things as well. But anything else that uh, you, that you wanted to quickly cover before we kind of close uh, close the books on hard drives? Well, I, I I just gave you some links in the that you could put in the show notes that I th I think are good jump off points if you wanted to to go over to a home server show and see some of the some of the performance numbers that I've run and start and looking at some of the other stuff. I know Kevin Schoonover's posted some stuff over there, and uh, uh, you know a lot of other people have, and so it's 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 just. Uh, uh, there's nothing really specific, I think. Um, I oh, there was one thing that was in the I had in the notes that I'm I'm not sure if you had talked about in the past, but uh, there's a podcast called My Hard Drive, uh, and uh, put out by Scott Moulton. He just came out with a new uh, podcast, um, and it, the thing was the new podcast. He hadn't done a podcast for a while, so it's. Uh, uh, probably the first half of the podcast is marketing for his upcoming training <laughs> exercises. Oh, but if you skip through and listen to the last, say, 30 minutes, uh, he had some interesting stuff, uh, especially about, uh, like, these external hard drives that you get and how, uh, you know, it used to be when external hard drives came out, you could go and you'd buy them and take the case off and use it use the hard drive as an internal drive it, it just had the SATA port even though you know as an external drive was in a case with a USB port well now the manufacturers uh, partly is to save money and I think also to uh, uh, stop people from doing that they don't even put a SATA port on it the card is there but they solder a USB port onto the the board of the hard drive itself, and so he he it's interesting at least from a technical perspective, uh, just listening to him talk about how when he goes to try to recover data from those drives, how he has to address that that issue because he with a lot of normal USB ports he doesn't get the uh, uh, I I would uh, call it diagnostic or uh, auditing type information that he could get if he had it attached to a SATA port. So, yeah. you know, for fun, that, that would be a good thing to listen to. But he has some previous podcasts about SSDs and hard drives, I think, that are, that are very, very good, that are worth going back to listen to. You bet. Well, we'll get those listed in the show notes. That is That show is called My Hard Drive Died. Oh, and then you can go to myharddrivedie.com to get and that uh, the preview. If show. I could add one other thing, I, I noticed I had some RAID links in there. And what I tried to do though was just put in links that I uh, that I have posted over at Home Server Show, that are what I call educational links. That are, you go in and uh, it tells you, uh, well, like one is discussion. It's a BYOB podcast discussion of RAID hard drives and SSDs. It's a very good discussion. Uh, they they really handle it well. And there's some other they're more academic type links uh, on storage configuration assessing the reliability of RAID systems, why if you go over uh, three terabyte drives in a RAID 5, why you're asking for trouble, you know, it goes to the mathematics, why you, uh, you know, you're likely to have another failure before you get the, the RAID rebuild and stuff like that. But it's, and also calculators on how to calculate the reliability of different RAID configurations. So that, that, that stuff's all there. Okay, good. We'll put that out in the show notes so you can take a peek at those. Some really good ones. You know, including a link from HP called Help Me Choose the Raid. So you can go out and take a peek <laughs> at that one. Thank Andrew will thank you for that. Um, John Zadler, anything anything else you want to throw in there before we go into uh, some updates? No, I'm good. All right, perfect. Well, um, we'll close the books on hard drives. We spent like, three weeks doing it, and uh, appreciate all you guys jumping in and, and talking about that. It's you know one of those things when I started thinking about it, I thought, well, there really isn't that much to talk about, but there actually is quite a bit out there. John, just on some of your couple your links alone, we probably could have talked uh, most of the evening about some of that stuff. So I appreciate doing that. I want to pop over to uh, Christian because uh, we're coming up towards the end of the summer here, and. Christian, I know there's some things going on, and of course, there's, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not putting you on a spot here, so just talk about whatever you can. But, 
Give us a quick uh, give us a quick update on what's going on with you. I know you'll be tr transitioning out of your internship because uh, school starts here pretty quick. Yep. So, uh, give us a quick update. Yeah, so I'm pretty much wrapping up. Um, I'm in the kind of documentation data dump phase of everything I've done. Um, really just giving my final recommendations to the team that I've worked with for the past year and a half or so on uh, where we can go in the big data space. Um, and moving on, um, school starts here uh, in early September. Um, so there's going to be a lot of stuff going on there. And uh, I'm real close to it, but I'm not going to say anything yet. But I will be able to tell you where my future lies hopefully next week. Um, it, it's very close and very exciting. Um, and so that will kind of usher in a whole new segment of um, where I'm going to be in the data world. So I'm kind of excited about that as well. Very so, cool. A little bit of mystery yeah. there, but it will unveil itself. We'll, we'll tease it out for next week. We'll tell people they've got to they come back if you want to hear it live next <laughs> Thursday. Uh, August 8th, uh, over at TheAverageGuy.tv slash live. Ninth. Ninth, sorry. I guess I can't do my Oh, math. it is 8th. My bad. No, it is 8th, yeah. 7 my plus bad. 1. <laughs> my bad. It's a 9th for me. You... <laughs> yeah, you were thinking about Australia time. Oh, so. right. You know yeah, what I you, need you to... Just wanna live. You're like every American. You just want to live in Australia. We know. <laughs> yeah, really, I do. <laughs> but except the snow is bad this year. We were talking about that in the, the pre-show. Andrew, I hear the little ones behind you. How are things uh, How are things going with the... With yeah, the they're good. Uh, they're, both, they're both starting to get teeth, so... Uh, seven, seven, seven and a half months old, and we've just gone through the the whiny bitchy phase of oh my goodness, I've got I've got teeth arriving. <laughs> but yeah, no, they're good. They're good. um they're they're happy. They're happy kids. So that's all we could ask for, really. You look like you maybe you've gotten a little bit more sleep these days. No, I need a bit more sleep. I think I need to stop <laughs> sleeping. Ouch. We're we're actually getting you back on the podcast, which is always good. So it's yeah. it's good to have you back, and then. I'll give you a couple more months off, and then we'll try and get you back on the show notes. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> How's that sound? We'll see. <laughs> Good enough. I, yeah, you've kind of enjoyed a nice break. Uh, if you, you know, and I always wonder how many actually go out and look at the show notes. We spend a bunch of time. I, I listen to the podcast almost all the way through one time and kind of wonder, does anybody ever go through and look at those? So, you know, do. What, do you? Sure. <laughs> well, it would make sense that you go through it, John. <laughs> but oh, thanks. I'm wondering if I'm wondering. Well, you're a thorough guy. You you like you know you go through. You're very methodical. I wonder if anybody else goes through and uh, and looks at the show notes. Sometimes as I'm going through the podcast, uh, listening to it to get all the you know to mine all the links out. I wonder if anybody you know kind of goes through that to do it. So, um, anyways, if you uh, if you got some comments or questions on the show notes, love to know how you use them and uh, and how we could do better or do you even go look at them. So I mean, email podcast at theaverageguy.tv. I mentioned this last week uh, in the show, but want to uh, say thanks to our listeners. We've had a great month on Amazon and uh, that Amazon affiliate link out at theaverageguy.tv slash Amazon. Uh, we're turning those. I've said before that I'm turning those into giveaways, and and I'll mention it again just because I want to give. I said it so many times. I just want to give the. I want to be totally transparent. Well, we're finding that giveaways just don't really do much for you guys uh, from a show perspective, and so we're going to actually try and turn those dollars into uh, into review units that folks can review stuff. I was actually talking with Zadler. We got to figure out a way to get Canadian and the U.S. Amazon stores together. It would make my life a whole lot easier. <laughs> get, to get that done, but uh, we turn we're gonna try and turn those into reviews. If you have something you want to review and you're here in the U.S. and uh, it, you can, uh, we we have a little bit of a review scholarship fund. So just send me a note, podcast at theaverageguy.tv. Uh, tell me what you want to review, and uh, maybe we'll be able to get that sent to you, and we'll expect a write up on it, and uh, maybe even a guest appearance on the podcast. So give that a try if you want, and we'll turn those Amazon dollars into uh, into that kind of stuff. And then when you're done, you get to keep it. And we don't have any conflict. I always hated that conflict of interest when I had vendors send stuff or when we got stuff from vendors. I just hated that. I'd rather just buy it, let you keep it, test it out. And uh, so for, mm. for doing that, uh, we'll let you keep it. How's that sound? So let's let's give that a roll as well. John Stutzman, I'm going to see you for the first time here on September 22nd, which is going to be great. We're going to meet in person for the first time at the Home Service All Show right. Meetup. 
It's gonna be it's gonna be great. John and I have a, a ongoing joke in the background. I the first time I met him, I didn't remember <laughs> that I'd met him, and uh, <laughs> so I, I had I, to Photoshop myself into all those pictures. <laughs> it was it was terrible. <laughs> it's uh, what happens when you can't even remember your own kids' names, and uh, and so um, we are September 21st, Indianapolis, Indiana. If you're anywhere close. To that location, you should get involved in the Home Server Show Average Guy Surface Geeks Meetup. And uh, Zadler, it would be fantastic if we could find a way to get you down there. Sarah, my wife, said to me the other day, how are we going to get Zadler down there? <laughs> so uh, we got to figure out a way to get you to the meetup at some point. But uh, we're getting together. There's about almost 60 guys and gals, a couple gals coming. And uh, you can head over to homeservershow.com and get all the details on the meetup that's coming up September 21st, 2003, if you're listening to this podcast after that, sorry, you missed it. It was probably really, really good. It, it's going to be the best ever. Yeah, it's going to be the biggest ever, for sure. That's for sure. I, I don't know about the best, but we've got uh, we got a Friday night. It starts on Friday night now, so there's some pre-registration on Friday night if you get in town early. We're going to be setting up boxes out at the hotel that we're at, and uh, uh, that will uh, ease the crunch on Saturday morning that we've always had of trying to get stuff set up. And so Saturday morning, we'll get right into some breakouts, and we get a keynote and some breakouts that we'll be doing. Saturday evening, we'll be getting together for dinner. We'll be hitting the Microsoft Store. We'll be hitting fries. So you'll want to be a part of that. We're going to spend some money. Where is the location we... here? This is Indianapolis, Indiana. Think you can make it, Christian? Uh, let's Come on, wait. Christian. You wait. can make it. Uh, road let's... trip. Yeah. Hold on, trip. hold on, hold on. All right. All right. College road trip. Wait, wait, wait. Where is it again? <laughs> it's September 21st, Indianapolis, Indiana. All right, I can tell you in like two. Okay, minutes. well you're. I'll keep talking while you're you're doing that. So, Saturday night we've got uh, dinner, Microsoft, and fries, and then Sunday morning, first time, first ever meetup, Waffle House. That's gonna happen. There's a Waffle House <laughs> down. Spons uh, sponsored by Mike Howard from well, Perfect Raw. Sponsored by everyone who goes will buy their own breakfast. But <laughs> Jim, it's a 500-mile drive. Oh, that's nothing. Oh, that's, that's Jim. Nothing. Um, how, how many? What's the what's the hours? That's a nine. That's a nine-hour drive in current Two, traffic. I'm doing nine. nine. Christian, if, look, Christian, hours. if I'm coming from Australia, you can come from wherever you are. You are not coming from Australia. <laughs> if I was, would you go? Probably. <laughs> Christian, I've made that drive what three times now. It's ten hours from Omaha, so I'm not saying you can't do it, but mm. I'm just saying. I, I don't Mike, know. the Amtrak is sounding kind of nice right now. Uh, well, there you go. Mike Howard is coming up from Atlanta. I will pick you up. Get on a plane, man. I'll yeah, pick you up. Tinker guy is coming down. Yeah, uh, Paul Brarin just announced he is coming. Rich O'Neill will be there. And, yeah. um, oh, my God, be in pay for it, though. You, you it watch. Is, it is gonna, <laughs> this is going to be, I'm not sure, this could be like the the uh, the hangover, I think. <laughs> oh, God. The hangover part four, tech edition. <laughs> the the tech edition in Indy. Yeah. Yeah, and, the, and the meetup's only about a block away from Fry's. I mean, uh, the, home server that? palooza. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not not only not just home server, we're adding the Surface Geeks component to it, and so there'll be tablets and and those kinds of things to talk about. And if if you've haven't noticed yet, uh, Microsoft has dropped the price on the Surface RT, 350 bucks. So if you want to head out, I got a link on the page. You can go out to the Average Guy TV and take a peek at that if you want to get to the new RT, or the old RT box with went with Office, what it comes with, and maybe fire would sale. You really buy, would you would you really buy an RT? Uh, would I? No, nah, probably not yeah. at this point. No, uh, <laughs> they've lost more money than they took in on that now. Yeah, right. Yeah, they had a nine hundred million dollar write-off last yeah. last quarter for it. Yeah, and their uh, total and revenue was like eight hundred forty-six million, and that doesn't count the pro tablets. That's just the RT. So they lost a ton of money on it. Yeah. Their, yeah. That total revenue of eight hundred forty-six, I believe, included both the RT and the pro edition. And with the nine hundred million dollar write off, that means on both products they're in the whole millions of dollars. Yeah, I think there's yeah. no ju uh, there's no question they they lost lots of money. They made too many RTs and not enough pros. And uh, so that's why I said it's not an iPad, right? It's not a what? It's not an iPad. Yeah, no, it's not. Hey, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it is not. Uh, in I, the, I brought something to show you guys. Yeah, it's uh, my first uh, hard drive. 
It's a, a Seagate ST225. It's 20 megabytes. Uh, back when uh, hard drives were really hard drives, is uh, oh. five and a half inch, five and a quarter inch. Yeah. And get that uh, up in the screen there, so we can see the full thing. Hold it sideways. Okay. There we go. There you go. Very nice. You know the 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 mechanics of a hard drive have really not changed that much. I mean, yeah. those components are still in. They're they're configured a little bit different. But those that still looks like a hard drive today. Yeah, that's is that a record player? <laughs> yeah, it almost looks like it. But uh, yeah, that's 20 meg, which was a phenomenal storage in its time because the uh, the IBM XT had come out with 10, and then this this thing it was a half height drive, 20 meg. It was just uh, incredible. And then I never thought I would run out of storage, but I was starting to run low, so I got <laughs> the uh, ST251 which doubled the size. It was uh, 40 meg, and let's see, can you see, the, maybe if I get back a little bit, Yeah. and you it's can see the uh, top of it. Um, you know, it's not advisable to take the covers off the hard drives, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't work real well, but uh, yeah. It, What's it's the just, port connection on that? It's a 40 meg. It's a daughter integrity issue. Uh, hold that up just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, Is that a parallel port? <laughs> what is that port? I can I have a hard time seeing it. It's a very right. old. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is that's what we use. It. This is what we use in our Hadoop yeah, clusters now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's that's big data right there. Yeah, you got that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> big data for sure. Dun very dun nice. dun. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think I found a quantum Bigfoot the other day. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> This has as much storage on it as the uh, as the IBM 350 did that I uh, learned programming on in uh, in uh, well actually it was in high school but then later in college but uh, uh, that's, well good that's stuff pretty thanks cool. thanks for the uh, yeah thanks I I had and, you know I, I had a 10 meg hard drive for a while and uh, I thought oh, well what do you need this for I wish I hadn't got rid of it now that's that a Dalek isn't it John this this is a uh, glass insulator. Uh, this this is only this is on a completely different spectrum. This is power. Uh, old, it's an old power glass uh, insulator. This is the part of sh the show where we reminisce about the old days. Yeah. yeah Maybe we should just do a show, a nostalgia are show. You're calling so. John old. You're calling John old now. Right? When I am. Yeah. I yeah. actually. Am. <laughs> now, <laughs> Dude, Christian you know is bored is. out of his mind. <laughs> I'm just. Yeah. I've, I'm lost here. He's checked do, out. Do you know what this Christian's is? looking at it, saying. What's transmitted power? Isn't that all just wireless? What's, what's transmitted power? That looks like power? a cable that got cut. That that is uh, one uh, a cross section of one phase of a 345 kV line that uh, you would bury. Uh, yeah. And oh, uh, damn, my video is frozen. <laughs> <laughs> but we can still hear well, you. Hey. <laughs> Well, hey, John, let me wrap this up, and we'll go into the post show. I know Kevin Schoonover just picked up a Gen 8 uh, HP microserver today. We're going to try and bring him in in the post show and, uh, and talk a little bit about that. I'll remind folks that if they come out Thursday nights, uh, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern here in the U.S. time zones, they can join us. That's about noon in Eastern Australia, I think, right? 11? Is it 11 noon? I can never remember with the time change, Andrew. What What's 8 p.m. Central? Translate to your time. Oh, he's locked up, isn't he? For yeah, he, he for for Andrew, he he looks like he locked up. Maybe Rennie can give us that. But we get a lot of listeners. I, I, as I look at the stats, we get a lot of listeners from the Australia uh, that uh, the Eastern Seaboard of Australia because it's a great time zone. For well, his his listening. time right now is noon. Noon. So it's 11 a.m. Eastern Australian time. I think that's the, the zone they're in. But join us. Out here live, you can't get the post show unless you come to the live show. So we want you to come out and join us live, uh, like I said, 8 p.m. Uh, Central, 9 Eastern, each Thursday night. And I uh, want to thank everybody for coming out. John Zaller, John Stutzman, Christian Johnson, hey, great. Andrew Morris, thanks for coming out, guys. I'll remind folks that uh, there's easy ways to listen to the podcast. We've spent a bunch of time on the site over the last couple months and uh, put some, some new ways to subscribe, either iTunes or Stitcher. And actually, I was uh, mentioned this before. I'm trying to get us on iHeartRadio as well. So if you're an iHeartRadio listener, you can go out and search for financial tech. Will be on there in a couple of days, so you can go out there and take a peek at that. Home tech didn't make it the first time. I resubmitted it, so we'll see if we can get on there. But all kinds of ways 
to listen to the podcast on a regular basis, and hopefully you're getting it in one of those ways. Um, and it, Stitcher is another way to do that, to search Home Tech, and uh, you can get that. We're also on Spreaker, Podomatic, Audioboo, iTunes, Xbox Marketplace, wherever podcasts are found. So no excuse not to get us on a regular basis. You can also view and subscribe to the show out on YouTube. Just go to theaverageguy.tv slash YouTube. You can catch the show each week. I mentioned that before right here at theaverageguy.tv slash live. Don't forget we have groups on Facebook. That's the group you really want to be a part of. So go to Facebook. I'm sorry, just go to theaverageguy.tv slash Facebook. I do have a Google Plus group, although it's not getting a lot of traction. So it may be because I never mentioned the address, but that is theaverageguy.tv slash Google. And again, thanks for using the Amazon link. That's the average guy.tv slash Amazon when purchasing from there. It doesn't cost you any more, and we make a little bit that we're going to turn into some, hopefully, some reviews or some technology scholarship fun uh, that we'll get going. All right, our time is up. Thanks for coming out tonight. Stay around for the post show. We'll dial in Kevin Schoonover and see if we can get an update on the Gen 8 box. And we'll put Christian to bed because he's looking pretty tired. You got me beat. <laughs> <laughs> he is pretty tired. We'll bring Andrew back. Good night, guys. Thanks for coming Hi. out.